welcome to the Soul Body Horse podcast, where we celebrate the horses that change us and the modalities that take us there. I'm your host, Meredith Crawford. In today's episode, we have a very special guest, Alicia Harlov. For hoof care aficionados, Alicia needs no introduction. She's a full-time hoof care provider servicing the North Shore of Massachusetts and the surrounding areas. She is also the creator of the Humble Hoof podcast and operates the Humble Hoof Rehab Facility in Amesbury, Massachusetts. She loves educating horse owners on how to grow the healthiest hoof possible and believes that getting a horse sound is often a matter of finding the right pieces to the puzzle. She is on a never-ending journey to find as many tools as she can to help as many horses as she can. I reached out to Alicia to come on to the podcast when she alluded to a single horse, Vinny, that sent her down the rabbit hole of hoof care and rehab. So Alicia, your name is synonymous with healthy feet and holistic hoof care, yet I understand you started off as an elementary school teacher. Tell us about Vinny and the journey you went on to become one of the biggest advocates for healthy hooves. So I was just teaching full-time in a public school, elementary general music, And that was obviously my passion. I mean, I went to undergrad for it. I got my master's degree in music education. And a few years into teaching, let me see, four years into teaching, I adopted or I bought a Mustang who's already trained. And I bought a Mustang because I thought that they had the hardiest feet. They were always going to be sound. You know, they're really easy keepers or all these pros to why I sought out a Mustang. And five months into owning him, he came up lame. And I just assumed like, oh, he probably just has a stone bruise or some issue that's temporary. And the vet came out and took radiographs and found that he had really significant navicular bone damage and remodeling and basically told me that this was the end of his performance career or any hopes that I had for him. And I was unwilling to accept that. So as I worked through his diagnosis and started, you know, traveling the world, finding new resources of navicular rehab and finding new ways to help him, I started getting less focused on teaching music. And my prep periods at school started turning into me reading more about hoof care and how to trim and how to help navicular issues and learning more about track systems and all these different things. And it got to the point where eventually I had been trimming my own horse for a bit, trimming Vinny and got him comfortable and back into ridden work. And I had some other people who started asking me to trim for them. And I got certified through progressive hoof care practitioners. And it got to the point where I couldn't do both. I couldn't teach music and trim at the same time. And when I looked at those two things, I couldn't envision myself not working with horses full time. And so I took a one year leave of absence from teaching to see, do I like that? Do I really want to trim for the rest of my life kind of thing? And could I make it work? And within two months of taking that leave of absence from teaching, I was like busier than I could even handle trimming. And so I wrote a letter to my school principal and said, I wouldn't be back. You know, that was 2019. And I guess the rest has uh, been a quite a journey since then. Wow. So for the listeners out there who are unfamiliar with it, can you unpack what navicular is? Yeah. So navicular, traditionally, navicular disease means that the navicular bone, which is a tiny canoe shaped bone in the horse's hoof, they diagnose navicular disease when that bone has remodeling on x-rays. And vets might say that a horse has navicular syndrome if they have pain coming from the back half of their foot as found on a lameness exam, but there's nothing seemingly wrong on those x-rays. The issue with that terminology is that There are so many structures in the back half of the foot that can have problems. There's the deep digital flexor tendon and the impar ligament, the collateral ligaments, the navicular bone itself, but also the frog and digital cushion, all these other external structures like the heels and the quarters and the sole and bars. And when you are doing a lameness evaluation and finding through nerve blocks that the pain is coming from the back half of the foot, we don't know for sure what structure is being affected. So navicular, in my opinion, is really just a catch-all term that's used to describe a horse that has pain in the back half of its foot. So when I come to a horse that's diagnosed with navicular, 
even if it has bone remodeling on x-rays, I don't automatically assume that's what's causing pain. I want to parse out any structure that's less than healthy and see once we get those strong, is that horse still lame? And I would say almost all the time, they are no longer lame once we get the other structures as strong as they can be. Wow. So when you started down this path with Vinny, what were some of the places that you went to look and what were some of the first things that you looked at? Yeah. So I started Googling as one does. Back then I was super fortunate that there had already been a lot of interest in navicular rehab. This is a 2014 when he got his diagnosis. So two or three of the first resources I came to One was Pete Ramey, who is a trimmer slash hoof rehab specialist based out of Georgia. He has a ton of resources online. His website is hoofrehab.com. He was one of the first names that I came to that talked about hope for these navicular cases that had previously been written off. One of the other names I came across was Dr. Robert Bowker. And he used to work at the University of Michigan studying navicular issues, pathology, trim to make sure that navicular issues don't happen or to rehab them. And he had a lot of, again, really promising results in getting these horses back to work. But the biggest one that I was just super fascinated by was Rockley Farm in England. They're in Exmoor, right on the coast, super beautiful area. And they are a navicular specific rehab that has been in operation for over 15 years now. I'm not exactly sure when they started, but between 15 and 20 years ago. And they have an 85% success rate of getting horses back to the same level of work or higher than before the horse went lame. And they only take in horses on vet referral. So these cases are horses that have been diagnosed by a vet and most of them have had an MRI. So they have proof that these horses have either significant soft tissue damage or significant bone damage to the navicular bone. And despite that pathology within that hoof, they're getting these horses back to competition. So in 2015, my husband, who just loves to humor me and is so amazing and (laughs) supports me in whatever I do, he flew with me to go visit Rockley Farm. And that's where I sort of became, I guess the best word for it is obsessed, like with navicular rehab and getting these horses back to work and soundness. At this time, what were some of the things that you were doing with Betty's feet and what were you seeing? Yeah, so I think the first thing I noticed, which sadly I was not super aware of before this diagnosis was Vinny had what looked to be really good healthy hoof structure. I mean, he had strong Mustang feet. So he had really thick walls, good thick soles, a healthy alignment in terms of the HPA, the hoof pastern access. You wouldn't look at his hooves or confirmation and think that he should have any issues. But one thing I noticed after I started learning more was he had pretty ratty frogs and he had deep central sulcus thrush infections. I could fit my hoof pick deep into the middle of his frog. And he was quite sensitive when he did that. So I started treating that. But not only that, I started feeding him the way that Pete Ramey and uh, Rockley Farm feeds their rehab cases, which is more of an ECIR approach, equine cushing and insulin resistance approach, which obviously not every horse has cushings or insulin resistance, but a lot of these horses that have hoof issues are just eating too high of a sugar and starch diet and it's causing this inflammation in their hoof capsule, even if they're maybe not diagnosed as metabolic, they can still struggle with feeling changes in these soft tissues from that extra sugar. I kind of compare it to, you know, I tend to be sensitive to gluten. So when I eat gluten, I can feel it in my joints and I don't really know why I don't have celiac. I'm not like a diagnosed you know, allergic to gluten. But when I eat things that don't agree with me, I can feel it in my body and I get achy. And I think that a lot more horses are more sensitive to sugar and starch than we realize. So I changed Vinny's diet. I did a full forage based diet. So no grain, as little sugar and starch as possible. And I started balancing his minerals in his diet. So basically testing his hay, finding out what the hay he was eating was deficient in, and then supplementing what it was needed to meet his daily requirements. So once I started doing that, even though he already had a fairly healthy hoof, his frog started getting healthier, which is, I mean, that's the shock absorber for the entire hoof. And it's obviously right below where the navicular bone is. If you have a weak frog and that horse is unwilling to weight it, 
then you're redistributing the ground reaction forces going up that entire limb in movement. So he got a stronger frog from those changes, but he also started getting a better, tighter hoof capsule. Whereas before his feet were maybe like wider. And I thought he's like, oh, he has these really great big platter feet. Really, I think that they had this kind of universal flaring all the way around. So you couldn't really tell that he had a flare because it wasn't in one spot or another. And once he was on a better diet that was mineral balanced, he started growing in this tighter hoof capsule with these nice smooth walls. And he just was significantly more comfortable fairly quickly just from that. Now you're in New England. Where are you sourcing your hay from? So we're really fortunate that we have good local hay. I actually get my hay from Vermont. I mean, I've had Vinny now almost 10 years. So in the past, we've gotten hay from New York or Maine or even local fields in town when I used to live a little bit south of where I am now. But right now, all the hay that I feed is from Vermont. So it's all from New England. But usually in our area, people get hay from Canada or New York if they don't have a local source. Got it. And when you do your hay test, what are the markers that you're looking at? Well, first, what a hay test does is I'll take a hay corer, which is a specific tool that you attach to a drill, and it allows you to pull hay out, sam- hay samples out from the middle of a bale without opening the bale, which when I was boarding, the barn owners were not happy when I was trying to open 20 <laughs> bales to test it. So I take a hay corer, I, you know, using the drill, it spears right into the middle of the hay. I try to test as many bales as I can. So I might test like 30 bales at a time. So you get a good sample. And I send that into Equa Analytical. It's like $30 for the test I do. I do test number 601. And the main things that I look for, there are a few big things. So the first thing I look for is the moisture content. And the reason I look at that, I want it to be as as close to, I want the dry matter to be as close to 100% as possible. I mean, without being like straw, you know, most of the hay I get is around 90% for dry matter. And then I look at the calories, like, is this going to be a high digestible energy hay? And that might be better for a harder keeper, or is it going to be a low digestible energy hay that might be good for like a donkey or an easy keeper? And then I look at the protein, which I personally like to be around 10% or higher. I look at the ADF and NDF. That is what is marking the digestibility and palatability. And we like to do like a 40, 60 spread for that. So like ADF under 40%, NDF under 60%. And that will actually help to make sure that your horse isn't going to get like free fecal water from their hay. Horses that seem to have trouble with like gut issues or loose manure or free fecal water. A lot of times that ADF and NDF is just too high. The hay is just not digestible enough for them. But that also means if it's not digestible enough, it's, it's not going to be great for those harder keepers. And then the other thing is the major and minor minerals. So these are really important for hoof wall health and lamina health. So calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, all should be in ratio for a horse that's having hoof issues, especially. And then the iron, copper, zinc, and manganese. And there's been some kind of controversy about this over the last few years, but really we just do it based on the NRC requirements and the daily requirements for horses. So I want to see that these minerals, which each mineral is going to affect absorption of another mineral in any species. It's just how they interact. And I want to see that for the horses that I'm feeding, I'm making sure they're getting enough of copper and zinc, especially because there's been some research that feeding these two minerals, minor minerals, can actually help lower their susceptibility to things like white line disease But even just anecdotally, I've seen hooves so much healthier when these are in good amounts and absorb well. So that's basically what I look for. And I feel like it would be an entire podcast in itself if I went into mineral balancing, but there's so many resources online to do it. What were you playing with at this time with the minerals and with the hay as you were rehabbing Benny? Yeah. So I just had whatever hay the barn was feeding because I was boarding him when he came up lame. And then I found through my research, Pete Ramey was the one who actually was advocating for this supplement called California Trace. And it's available online. And I ordered it. I started feeding it. And I saw good results. And then I tested the hay. That was before I tested my hay. I tested my hay, found out it was high in manganese and low in some other things, needed some adjustment. 
So I swapped to another one called Arizona Copper Complete from Horse Tech. And through the years, I've done different things between making my own mineral mixes. And right now, my hay test actually does really well with Vermont Blend. But there's a lot of, like I said, commercially pre-made supplements that have good mineral levels. But a lot of supplements that you would assume would be good are not. So I've really gotten good at reading labels and trying to tell clients to read labels to make sure that things are actually as good as they market themselves as. And at this point, after you were working with his hooves and after you had balanced his diet, was Vinny able to work comfortably? Where was he? Yeah, he took quite a bit of time to become more comfortable. One really important thing for long-term soundness is a horse's uh, distal limb biomechanics. So how their hoof is hitting the ground. And for a while, Vinny wasn't landing as confidently heel first as I wanted him to, or, you know, what his internal structures needed to gain strength. It could have been a mixture of his internal pathology and his weaker frogs, but he was also landing harder on the outside of his foot and kind of rolling in. And both of those things, I think, were compounding some problems and took some troubleshooting to find a trim that made him the most comfortable, a diet that made him the most comfortable. And it took honestly a few years. Like I won't sugarcoat it. It wasn't instant. It took a few years until I was back in work with him. And then by I think 2017, I'm trying to remember exactly what year it was. By 2017, I was riding him weekly in lessons. Like I was taking weekly lessons and riding him in between with whatever homework the instructor was giving me. It was just centered riding lessons. I'm more of a dressage person and trail rider, honestly. And he stayed, he was in full work until one winter I actually hadn't had time to ride him very much. You know, I was in a friend's wedding. There was a whole bunch of compounding factors. And really when it comes to these rehab cases, the best thing you can do once they're sound is keep them in work because a lot of times they have to be stronger to compensate for past injuries. So for a person who has a back injury, if they keep their core really strong, their back won't hurt them as much. But if they let their core get weak, their back will start to bother them again. I think it's the same for these horses that have these past problems. When they're in work and they're strong, they don't notice their past problems. But if you let them deteriorate, they can go not so great again. So in winter of 2019, early in that year, I went to go get him from the paddock and he couldn't walk. And my first thought was like, oh, he has an abscess because he had been ridden and fine for like years, you know? And I brought him in. I had treated it as an abscess. After a week, I had the vet out to take x-rays. Nothing was found on the x-rays other than what he always had. And it was actually the opposite foot of his lame foot years before. And finally, it got to be where he was pretty much three-legged lame for a few months. And I was like, do I have to put this horse down? Like, I don't know what to do. So I spent the money to get an MRI and he had torn his deep digital flexor tendon pretty severely in the opposite foot of what was his previously lame foot. And I think it was a mixture of the frozen mud. We didn't have any snow cover that winter and the ground, it was like negative. It was below zero for weeks on end. And I think the frozen mud in his paddock, it just like stepped wrong and tweaked it and tore it. And from that, it took about a year and a half to rehab from that. That was a pretty significant tear. And at the end of that rehab, when he was comfortable enough, I actually had a client of mine who asked to um, lease him as a companion. So he was leased as a companion for the last three years. And he just came back, knock on wood, he's looking really good. But I think I'll need a trainer to help me get him back into work because he hasn't been ridden in essentially like four to five years. (laughs) But he's looking good. Wow. With all of this and with all of the hoof knowledge that you now have, what do you think can become possible within the horse-human relationship or really just in horse keeping and how we relate to horses? One thing that I've come to be more passionate about, well, two things, I guess. One is that our horses never chose to be with us and they never chose to end up in the life that they are in. And so I want to make, you know, for example, I want to make Vinny's life as positive and happy for him as I can make it. That meant adjusting my goals for him. So originally I was thinking he was going to be like a hunt horse and do these like limited distance endurance rides. And I mean, honestly, with how he's looking, maybe I'll get back there someday. 
But I had to adjust my point of view to say, you know what? I care about him. Like he didn't choose to be with me and he's not my slave. So I'm not going to make him my slave. (laughs) Um, I want to make him comfortable and happy and then adjust my purposes for him and my goals to what will suit him and us. And also, you know, I think that because I was forced to do more with him on the ground, I did a lot of like straightness training type stuff. I did positive reinforcement with him when he was lame. You know, sometimes I would just go and groom him. I think that there was a much stronger bond that was built than what I've had with other horses because it wasn't just I show up and put his tack on and ride him and then put him away. It was like I had to figure out how to make him more comfortable, but also how to read when he wasn't comfortable and how to listen to him when he needed things adjusted and go from there. So yeah, I think he's taught me a lot about cues for pain, ways to tell when horses are not happy doing something or not comfortable doing something, then kind of respect them more than what I was maybe like traditionally brought up doing. Were there resources that you use to learn about pain or discomfort? Or was that just something kind of fly by night, trial by fire? (laughs) I'm totally going to get this wrong, but I think it's Dr. Sue Dyson. And I'm questioning now if that's not right, but she has been a really great resource. I mean, I've watched some of her stuff for free, so I assume that it's still out there for free. She has some really great webinars on looking for pain that might not be previously perceived as pain, everything from tail swishing or, you know, swapping a lead, like things that are maybe thought of as behavioral that are actually pain indicators. And also that like pain face with a horse. And then a lot of it too is with Rockley Farm, where they do that slow motion video of the hoof landings to watch how that horse is moving. I've seen horses compensate for hoof pain and how they land. And that's just like, you know, 10 years of watching slow motion videos and looking at a slow motion video of a sound horse versus one that has laminitic issues versus one that has quote unquote navicular issues and watching how that hoof lands and how that hoof moves. And a horse can seemingly present the sound and be in full work, but because of the way they're landing, they're already compensating. I want to try to figure out why they're compensating before it becomes acute lameness. So yeah, I would say that diving into more of the biomechanics of things. And that's slightly different for every horse. I won't say that there's like one correct way a horse moves based on their conformation and build and movement and their hoof care. But Rockley Farm has really great videos of that. I've tried to post more videos of that. And Sue Dyson, like I said before, has good resources on that kind of thing. Amazing. Just to wrap up, what advice would you go back and give yourself now? I would give myself the advice of let it take the time it takes. Because I, for so long, was assuming that I just had to do like this, like steps one, two, and three, like treat his thrush, get his diet right, and trim him the right way, and he would just come up sound. But there are so many ways that horses, like I said, they compensate, and there's all these little knock-on compensation problems that have to kind of unravel in their body because they're protecting themselves from a lameness issue or a hoof issue. And so once their feet start to feel better, you then have to work through all those compensations. And I wanted it to take less time than it did. But ultimately, I think I learned so much more by having to take the long route to figure out all these different issues with Vinny. And I think it's in turn helped me to help other horses better than I would have otherwise. Well, thank you. If you'd like to learn more about Alicia, Vinny, or how to work with her, visit thehumblehoof.com. For more information about our host, Meredith Crawford, visit thelab.horse. Thanks for listening. (music) 